administering expired vaccine. A Burnaby pharmacy is apologizing after giving several customers an expired dose of AstraZeneca. My conversations with the league are that we're going to continue with our schedule here at some point and we're going to play all 56 games. The Vancouver Canucks provide an update on their COVID-19 outbreak and remain optimistic they can return to the ice and finish the season. Britain's Prince Philip has died, leaving behind a nation in mourning. How he's being remembered around the world and here in Canada, having visited our country several times. One thousand two hundred and sixty two new cases of COVID-19 announced in our province today. It's the second highest single day total during the pandemic. Over half of the new cases are in the Fraser Health region. There are currently just over ninety five hundred active cases in our province. And of those active cases, three hundred and thirty two people are currently hospitalized, one hundred and two of whom are in intensive care. Over 1 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccine have been administered in BC, over 87,000 of which are second doses. At Calgary, that was not something that was has been done on purpose, and even the company um, apologized. Save on Foods is apologizing after 10 customers received expired AstraZeneca COVID-19 shots at one of its pharmacies in Burnaby. It happened Monday at the Kingsway location. By the time the needles had gone into arms, the vaccines had already been expired for three days. We don't know what will happen because it's relatively a new vaccine. UBC infectious disease expert Harassi Back says, although concerning, he doesn't expect any negative effects for those people who received the expired doses. In my opinion, there is not a problem because it's only three days as long the vaccine was stored under the instruction of the manufacturer. It means like a minus 20, minus 70, or fridge. In response to the incident, Save on Foods writes, in part, as soon as we discovered the error, we immediately began contacting the impacted clients and making the appropriate disclosures and reports to the professional bodies. We have sincerely apologized to these customers who were impacted. We have taken steps to tighten, refine, and reinforce our operational processes. The company says it has contacted the medical health officer and is following their guidance guidance on how to continue to properly vaccinate the affected customers. BC's Ministry of Health tells City News Friday, in part, in general, those who receive an expired vaccine should be advised and recommended revaccination. The worst scenario is that they are not effective. There is no safety concerns because they are sterilized and they don't have any, any problem with contamination. Back advises those affected can easily be tested for the level of antibodies in their system to determine whether they will now need a third dose of the vaccine. Either way, he says it won't hurt for them to get an extra shot. The body will develop the antibodies and the the worst scenario that may be that your body will recognize the third vaccine, like, you know, there is someone that is attacking again, but that's the reason you have vaccines. So you may have mild symptoms of headache or dizziness or, you know, regular flu symptoms. Back adds it was likely unintentional and that people make mistakes. Pharmacies across the lower mainland are currently taking bookings for people aged 55 to 65 to get their COVID-19 vaccinations. In New Westminster, Ashley Burr, City News. The Vancouver Canucks COVID-19 situation continues to evolve. On Friday, General Manager Jim Benning and team physician Dr. Jim Bovard addressed the media on the latest news regarding the team's coronavirus situation. Dr. Bovard says while the virus started with one person, there's no finger pointing within the organization. We know that the individual had gone to a place within the guidelines and that place subsequently was discovered to have cases of COVID and that's, that's how it got into our organization. And uh, you know, we've made it very clear within our, our group that there's, there's no culprit here other than the COVID virus itself. My conversations with the league are that we're going to continue uh, with our schedule here at some point and we're going to play all 56 games. So those are the conversations I'm having right now with the league. 
it is clear that we need stronger control to combat variants of concern that are driving rapid epidemic growth in many areas of the country. Canada's chief doctor says we need stronger public health measures, but is reluctant to say what those measures might be. The Vancouver Park Board issued a general manager's order on Friday stating that all existing tents, temporary shelters and structures must be removed from Strathcona Park by 10 a.m. Friday, April the 30th. There have been numerous public safety concerns with the encampment and there have been multiple fires there in recent weeks. In a statement, the Park Board says the order says this is a necessary next step to close the encampment in the park and return the park to community use. The city says they will announce new locations across Vancouver that will be activated to support the homeless population in the coming weeks. A man is in a hospital with critical conditions after a shooting in Vancouver's Marpole neighborhood on Thursday night. Vancouver police say the driver of a black Dodge Ram pickup truck was parked near Southwest Marine Drive and U Street when he was shot. No arrests have been made. I can say that shortly before 9 p.m. last night, um, the driver of a vehicle parked near Southwest Marine Drive and U Street was shot. The driver then drove further east to Marine and 70th, where he approached a citizen to call 911. The victim was brought to hospital and remains there in critical condition. Investigators don't believe there is a risk to the public. The file is actively being investigated as we speak and no arrests have been made. Police also had an update on Vancouver's fourth homicide of the year that occurred Sunday on the downtown east side. A man was found on Hastings Street suffering from stab wounds. Police have identified the victim as 37-year-old Robertson Blake Russ, or rather that's Robinson, and they're asking for the public's assistance in finding the person responsible. Investigators believe that there are people in the area that witnessed this event, uh, or, or this tragedy, I should say. Um, it happened along Hastings Street between Carroll and Abbott. So as we all know, that's a very heavily populated uh, area. A lot of people walking on the street. So we are urging people to come forward, to speak to police with, and, and provide any information that they can. Um, they can call the homicide detectives at 604-717-2500, or you can always call Crime Stoppers anonymously, one 800 2228477. It was one of the most surprising polls that I think we've uncovered in this past year of COVID. A new survey shows an overwhelming majority of Asian Canadians are feeling more alone and often targets as the COVID-19 pandemic continues. We hear from a Vancouver area woman who says she's felt it and if she's hopeful, things will turn around quickly. Uh, I'm just glad that there is a, an awareness building around the topic right now. ICBC has announced that more COVID-19 rebate checks for customers will be mailed out at the end of April. The company will be mailing out just over 2.8 million checks to customers for a share of the $600 million in COVID-19 related rebates. ICBC started mailing small batches of checks near the end of March for eligible customers. Most customers who had vehicles insured for all or part of the six-month period between April the 1st and September the 30th of 2020 are receiving a COVID-19 rebate averaging 190 per policy. As of April 18th, around 940,000 have been issued. The province has announced that BC's lowest paid workers, liquor servers, are getting a boost in pay to match the federal minimum wage that's set to increase in June. The province says liquor servers earning minimum wage will make $15.20 an hour, up from $13.95, effective June 1st. Labour Minister Harry Baines says he's proud to put an end to the discriminatory lower minimum wage for liquor servers, 80% of whom are women. The argument uh, that the previously was used for the liquor service to be paid lower wages than the minimum wage because they got tips. But the survey uh, or the panel did came back that over 70 percent made uh, less than $15 an hour as liquor service. So I think it is the right thing to do. And uh, although we are going through some tough times due to COVID, but I think uh, the minimum wage workers, the lowest paid workers in the, country, in the province also need support from the government. The province says future increases to the minimum wage starting next year will be based on the rate of inflation to provide predictability. The race between vaccines and variants is at a critical point. The modelling prediction from two weeks ago that forecasts a resurgence is playing out in the data we are seeing now. 
of case counts plotting along the strong resurgence trajectory, it is clear that we need stronger control to combat variants of concern that are driving rapid epidemic growth in many areas of the country. Canada's COVID curve is in a near worst case scenario as outlined by public health modeling data. Dr. Teresa Tam says stronger, stricter controls are needed to stop the spread, particularly for variants of concern, but she wasn't able to offer specific guidance. It was really reducing contacts. Uh, which may mean also reducing mobility and, and essentially mixing. Um, and so we have seen uh, a number of provinces um, stepping up the measures just in the last uh, days, including where I'm sitting, Ontario. Um, that is really critical. So, you know, the messages uh, being sent out is um, right now in the Ontario setting, for example, is try to stay at home as much as possible. Throughout the pandemic, federal health officials have said the provinces are best suited to deciding what health restrictions are appropriate. But the growth of COVID in Canada is quickly accelerating. B117 has now reached 25,000 cases in five months, growing at the same rate as the original virus. But B117's growth comes after Canadians have already learned to socially distance, wash hands, and deal with life in lockdown, underlining the deadly nature of this variant. The PM himself ruled out once again any possibility of the federal government stepping in. I think we're all uh, recognizing that we don't want to be in this third wave, but we're here. Uh, and as we've been doing from uh, the very beginning, we've been working very closely with the provinces and territories to ensure that they have the supports necessary to make the right district decisions for their jurisdictions. Dr. Tam noted that data always lags behind real world conditions, needing around two weeks before models will reflect what's happening on the ground. This means our current crisis doesn't even reflect spread that may have happened over the Easter long weekend. Public health was also not able to outline what percentage of Canadians need to be vaccinated to reach herd immunity. The United Kingdom says it's reached herd immunity with 70% of people vaccinated. But Dr. Tam says Canada just doesn't have data on how vaccines affect transmission. There are some early signals, particularly uh, I've seen certainly with the mRNA vaccine. We need more data from the AstraZeneca vaccine. But the sort of pointing towards um, people having a, a reduced viral load, for example, in the back of your nose. Uh, those are all good signs that these vaccines may provide a degree of reduction in transmission. Exactly how much, we don't know. And there's still no delivery timeline yet for the Johnson & Johnson single-dose vaccine. Procurement Minister Anita Anand notes that nine nations have bought the J&J &J vaccine, but only one of them, America, is currently receiving any doses. In Ottawa, Shaoli Lee, City News. Prince Philip, the man who served his queen and country for most of his life, has died, leaving behind a nation in mourning. He helped to steer the royal family and the monarchy so that it remains an institution indisputably vital to the balance and happiness of our national life. Britain's royal family says it happened peacefully at Windsor Castle. He was two months shy of his 100th birthday. The bells at Westminster Abbey tolling 99 times, once for each year of his life. He's a bit of a lost soul that found a real purpose in serving the Queen and serving um, the Commonwealth. The Duke of Edinburgh married the future Queen in 1947. He at 26, she at 21. For the rest of his life, he was by Queen Elizabeth's side. For years I watched him walk in three paces behind the Queen with the mayoress and not the mayor, with the president's wife and not the president. <laughs> A consort to the crown, a companion to the British nation. But he was also known for making occasionally deeply offensive remarks. The Duke of Edinburgh is a blunt man. You know, he doesn't mince his words. Over the years, he's got into trouble for putting his foot in it and, and you know, making jokes that misfire. <laughs> The Duke had a fondness for Canada and its military forces, making more than 50 visits to our country. His last uh, time that he visited Canada 
was to visit Toronto, and that was in April of 2013, when he presented a new colour to the 3rd Battalion of the regiment. This retired colonel of the Royal Canadian Regiment has met Prince Philip eight times. He's uh, one of these people who totally focuses on the person to whom he's speaking. As I've come to expect after many years as Colonel-in-Chief, your record is impeccable. Justin Trudeau says Prince Philip will be remembered in Canada for his service to young people. I know that through the Duke of Edinburgh's award, he helped empower millions of young people from all backgrounds, including here in Canada, to realize their greatest potential. And that's just one example of his many contributions. Both Prince William and Prince Harry have posted full-page tributes to their grandfather online. Now, Prince Philip will lay in rest at Windsor Castle before a funeral at St. George's Chapel. The palace is urging the public not to attend because of the pandemic. For more on Prince Philip's life and legacy, you can watch a full obituary on our website. Karen Siolin, City News. No matter what, even if we're born and raised here and we've never been back to Asia, we will, just by the way we look, we will always be considered a foreigner. And that's very, very hard. A new survey by Insights West in partnership with Omni Television has found roughly a quarter of Asian Canadians living in BC have been the recipient of a racial slur, both directly and indirectly. That same poll showing more than 80% feel racism is a serious problem in the province, having gotten worse since COVID-19. Rhiannon Yi is a local woman. She lives in Burnaby and tells us over the last year, she has noticed a change. When you assign like a group of people to blame for the pandemic, it just it's just everything all hell breaks loose, to be very honest. And that's what we see happening. Yi says she's been the recipient of terrible comments since childhood on her language, culture or food. Then as an adult working as a flight attendant before the pandemic, she says it continued. They would make really terrible remarks and it's sad to say but that that happened what happens to you in that moment well it uh, wow <laughs> i don't even know how to describe the emotions uh, especially strangers they they have no idea who you are it was one of the most surprising polls that I think we've uncovered in this past year of COVID. Steve Mossop is the president of Insights West. He explains 43% of those surveyed reported being the target of discriminatory behaviors in the past year alone. He says roughly 5% reported being assaulted and experienced property damage. He warns confidence that sentiments will improve is low. We ask people if they project out a year from now, do they think this is just a one-time thing or if it's based on COVID? And uh, only 8% unfortunately think that the problem is going to go away in a year's time. It's, a, it's very difficult to say. I'm hoping that it'll be as soon as possible. But, uh, you know, I just have to have faith in humanity at this point. In Vancouver, David Zura, City News. Vancouver's news is always available on the radio with News 1130 or online anytime at citynews1130.com. And we will be back tonight at 11 o'clock. Thanks for watching and have a great night.